2.3, differentiation rules. Okay, now every time I read this differentiation rules, I imagine like walking like under a bridge in New York City and like looking at graffiti, and there it is right there, differentiation rules, you know, and I'm like, yeah, there's some math vandals that own this turf. Yeah, differentiation rule. Maybe there's an exclamation point at the end, you know. Tattoos, right? Born to differentiate. Anyway, that's that's not the context in what we're doing this. We're going to be learning some rules that will help us find the derivative. So we call them differentiation rules. But it's fun to imagine a group of math vandals walking around, you know, with their pocket protectors and their eyeglasses. What are you doing here? You know, <laughs> this is our turn. Anyway, um, that would that'd make a good, like, TV show, right? I don't know. Before we start, dy, dx is a noun. It's a person, place, or thing. This one happens to be a thing. dy, dx. This is the derivative of y with respect to x. This is the same as y prime. This is the same as f prime. This is Leibniz notation. Okay? It means, again, the derivative of y with respect to x. So... It's important to know that. If you want to kind of put there here that this is y prime, it's the same as f prime of x, same thing. But d dx is a verb, okay? It's an action word. And what it means is to take the derivative with respect to x of the expression that follows it. Okay, so if you see d dx of x, that means what is the derivative with respect to x of x? And we can answer that right now without any knowledge of the, the shortcut rules, and we don't even have to use the limit definition because the derivative gives us the what of the graph at any point? Slope. And what does the graph of y equals x look like? A line, yeah, with the slope of what everywhere? One. So guess what the derivative of x is? One, because the slope of that graph, y equals x, is one everywhere. Let's try another one. What would be the derivative with respect to x of seven? Without any knowledge of the rules, that is a graph, y equals 7, and it graphs as another straight line, but this one is actually what? Horizontal. What's the slope of that line anywhere and everywhere? Zero. So guess what the derivative of 7 is? Zero. How about the derivative of 17? Zero. How about 177? Zero. Okay. That takes us to our first rule, actually. It's called the constant rule, meaning the rule never changes. No, that's not what it means. It means it tells us how to take the derivative of a constant. And you know what? It doesn't change. Here's what it says. It says the derivative of a constant is what? Zero. And that makes perfect sense because if the derivative tells us how fast something's changing, by the very definition, a constant is very reluctant to change, right? I'm constant. I was born a 7. I'm going to be a 7 forever. Don't try to change me. So how fast are you changing? I'm not. Zero. That's the rate at which I'm changing. Zero. I'm not changing. I'm a 7, okay? or any number for that matter. And again, graphically, it's a horizontal line, and we're measuring the rate of change of the line, and of course, the slope of a horizontal line is 0. So there's two ways to think about that. So we could do it in the verb format. The derivative with respect to x of c, where c is some constant, is what? 0. Um, or you could do it in the noun format. If y equals c, then the derivative of y with respect to x, or y prime, is 0. All right, ready to try it out? Example one, ready to try out this new rule? All right, we're going to be practicing not only the constant rule, but we're going to be practicing our notation, notation, and what would be the third one? Notation. So find the derivative of the following functions. If y equals 8, then what's the derivative of y? Zero. Okay, so you can show that as y prime equals zero, or you can use Leibniz notation, dy dx equals zero, either one. That was pretty easy, right? Now, notice that we have two sides of this equation. So I have to take the derivative of the left side first. What's the derivative of y? y prime. What's the derivative of 8? 0. So what we're actually doing, and why I left the space there, is we're actually doing this to both sides. We are taking the derivative with respect to x of both sides. Now, you're not going to have to show that step in general, but this is a verb. And you can take the derivative of both sides. It would have to go in front of the expression on both sides. Because it's like taking the natural log of both sides. The derivative of y with respect to x equals the derivative of 8 with respect to x. 
And now what becomes of the left side? What do you think the derivative of y with respect to x is? Well, it's dy dx. This y essentially can nestle up in the numerator with the d, and we get dy dx. And, of course, the derivative of a constant is zero. So you can go straight from here to here if you want to, but that's essentially what's happening behind the scenes. All right, questions on A? You ready for a quiz? Not yet. We need more, a little bit more practice, right? Letter B. If f of x is 0, let's take the derivative of the left side first. What's the derivative of f of x? f prime of x. Typically, we use the f prime notation. And now the hard part. What's the derivative of 0? Zero? 0, yeah. What's its derivative? 0. Uh-huh, that number. See, f of x equals 0. What's its derivative, though? Zero, right, okay, so I think we know the number that we're trying to differentiate, there's no use repeating it. I'm asking for its derivative, its rate of change. What is that number? Okay, zero. All right, I'll just tell you the answer, since you're not giving it to me. The derivative of zero is in fact itself, zero, and maybe that's what y'all are trying to communicate to me. I see that now, okay. All right, so what would be the graph of the derivative of zero? What does y equals zero the function look like? The x-axis. And its derivative then would be the graph of the x-axis, right? So, wow, that's cool. Okay. It, it, it is its own derivative. Zero is its own derivative. Is seven its own derivative? No. But zero is its own derivative. Hmm. I wonder if there's anything else that's its own derivative. Hmm. We'll have to think about that as we go through the year. All right. S of t equals 3. Notice I've, I've gone crazy and changed the variable on you. The, the independent variable is t. The function's name is s. So what's the derivative of the left side with respect to t? s prime of t. Okay, and now the hard part. The derivative of 3? 0. Good. Couldn't stump you all. Now there's another way to do it. Leibniz notation also works. You could say the derivative of s with respect to t is 0. It's the same thing. Uh, Leibniz notation uh, preserves the independent variable and the dependent variable. But typically, if you start with function notation, we keep it in function notation. Okay, this one's kind of tricky. If y equals k times pi squared, where k is a constant, and of course pi is our old friend, 3.14159, then what's the derivative of the left side? y prime, okay, or dy dx. And the right side, careful, Zero. Carefully zero, right? Okay, can't trick y'all. Any questions on the constant rule? Y'all ready for a quiz? You know, we should probably verify one of those. You want to verify one of those? Let's verify this. Let's verify, let's verify this one using the limit definition. You want to do that? Let's do the limit definition for 8. If y equals 8, then y prime should be the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, right? That's the definition? Okay, so I need to plug in an x plus h for x into 8. Is that going to happen? No, there's no variable to plug into, so guess what? It's 8 minus what's f of x? 8 all over h. We got the limit as h goes to 0. That becomes 0 over h, the limit as h goes to 0, and of course, that becomes what? 0, and the limit of a constant is a constant. So, okay, we've proved it now with the definition. Now there should be no questions on the constant rule. All right, the next rule is one of my favorites, and it will become quickly one of yours. It's called the power rule, but you could call it the powerful rule, because you know what? It's full of power. It is full of power. It's a very powerful rule. And you're going to use it a lot, and you're going to like it a lot, okay? Here's what it says. It says, if n is any real number and a is some constant, which could be also any real number, in the function that's of the form f of x equals a times x to the n. So a would be your coefficient of your variable term, and n is the exponent. If you have a function that's written in that form, a times x to the n, then there's no need to set up the limit definition and evaluate it because the extraction has already been made. We've distilled that, that and we've come up with this new product, and it's called the power rule. 
you could simply do this to take its derivative. Okay, let me zoom back in. The derivative of a times x to the n will become a times n, that becomes your new coefficient, a times n is your new coefficient, times x to the n minus 1 becomes your new exponent. So equivalently, you could say it in, in noun form, f prime of x is a n x to the n minus first. So let's see what we actually did there. We started with a x to the n, my new coefficient is a times n. So what we essentially did is we multiplied first. We multiplied the exponent times the coefficient to get our new coefficient. Multiplication is pretty easy, huh? Should be. Go back home and review your times table if it's not. And then once you multiply, we've used the exponent already. Guess what? There's a cost for using the exponent. You deplete it by 1. So after you multiply the old exponent, uh, times the old coefficient to get your new coefficient, your new exponent is the old one minus 1. So multiply and then subtract. That's essentially what we're doing to make it simple. Multiply, subtract. Multiply, subtract. Multiply, subtract. Do you subtract and multiply? No, I think your dear Aunt Sally would have something to say about that, right? Uh -huh. Multiply and then subtract. Do we multiply and then add? No, we multiply then subtract. Do we divide and then subtract? No, we multiply and then subtract. That is cool. You ready to try out the powerful rule? Yeah, let's try it. Find the derivative of each of the following functions. Okay, if f of x equals 2x cubed, then f prime of x, that's the derivative of the left, should equal the limit as h goes to 0 of 2 times x plus h cubed minus 2x cubed all over h. And all I have to do now is expand that, right? Square multiply double square and then multiply by x plus 3 again, sledgehammer, Everything without an H should cancel, and then I can divide out the H's and then plug in, and then I'll get what for my answer? 6X squared. Wow. Look at that. You mean to tell me now that you could look at something like this right here, this limit, and you can now just say, oh, the answer is 6X squared? How do we get 6X squared? Well, the power rule tells us because it's written as 2 times X to the bless you power, where bless you is X to the third power. 2x to the third power, I multiply 3 times 2, which is 6, to get my new coefficient, and then I subtract 1 from the exponent 3 to get my new exponent 2, and it's that easy. Piece of cake. So, having said that, this makes now a wonderful multiple choice question, doesn't it? Doesn't it? If I give you something like this on a multiple choice question, and I say equals, the answer choice, one of them, would be 6x squared. And you would have two ways to figure it out now, right? You could sledgehammer this, or remember I told you the modified form is something that you're expected to know as well as the definition. You could just say, oh, that's just h going to zero. So that's just the derivative of, I don't like you, x plus h. So it's the derivative of 2x cubed, which I know now is 6x squared. And you wouldn't have to expand it. That's pretty neat. The powerful rule. All right, how about this guy? G of x equals the cube root of x over 3. I'm not even going to bother setting up the limit definition because if I can get that written in the form a times x to the nth power, I can use the power rule. Is it already written in that form? No. Can it be written in that form? Yes. So sometimes there's a little bit of rewriting that must be done in order to BOTC, to bust out the calculus. So I'm just going to put G of x equals because I'm not into the calculus step yet. Dividing by 3 is the same as multiplying by a third, so you'll want to put, pull that out as the coefficient. And then off to the side, you're going to have to write the cube root of x as x to some power. And, of course, this is nothing to us anymore. The cube root of x is x to the one-third. So now it's in the form a times x to the n. Here we go. The derivative of the left is g prime of x. What's the derivative of the right? One-third times one-third. We multiply to get one-ninth, right? We multiply straight across. A third times a third is a ninth. Times x to the what power? We subtract 1. What's 1 third minus 1? Negative 2 thirds. Yeah, so we're going to get really accustomed to working with fractions. 1 third minus 1 is 1 third minus 3 thirds, which is negative 2 thirds. And there you go. That's the derivative. Now, because it started with a radical, or if we wanted to use this, it's probably worth then cleaning it up to put it back into a usable format. So what we'll do then is we'll say the 9 is down there as a placeholder in the denominator. The negative exponent now slides the x to the denominator, yeah? 
and then it would be positive two-thirds down there. And, of course, then to the two-thirds, that would put it back under a cube root of x squared. So that's something you should be then pretty soon used to just doing automatically. X to the negative two-thirds is one over the cube root of x squared. So this is a nice version to use if we had to plug in to find the slope at a point. Well, we don't have to set up the limit definition at all. This would be some kind of crazy rat con kind of thing that we never even did with the cube root. So this power rule didn't just kind of fall out of the sky, did it, one day, and someone said, oh, it works. This is basically an extraction from the process of setting up the limit definition for any power function x to the n. And uh, this, this, again, is the distilled, the distilled version, the distilled product. So now we can use it as a formula or a rule. Okay, let's look at part C. It's 5 over 3x to the pi's power. You ever see anything to the pi's power? Power to the pi. Hmm. Can we take the derivative of that using the power rule? As is? Can I just say it's 5 over 3 times pi times x to the pi minus first power? Can I take? Can I use the power rule in the denominator? No. I have to be able to bring the x to the top and write it as a some coefficient times x to the n. So that doesn't work. Yeah, so we've got to bring it to the top. Very good. So y equals, we'll take the 5 thirds out to the side, times x to the negative pi power. That's the negative pi power. Okay, now we're ready to go. So the left side becomes either y prime or dy dx. I'll use dy dx. And we get negative 5 pi thirds, when we multiply by negative pi, times x to the, what do we do after we multiply? Subtract. So negative pi minus 1. That's it. That's as good as we can get. Pi is a real number. It's irrational, so negative pi minus 1. Now, if we're going to clean that up, that's negative pi or negative 5 pi in the top. The 3 is in the bottom. The x factor jumps back down to the bottom with the 3. And what becomes of the exponent? We have to change the sign, don't we? Is it positive pi minus 1? Positive pi plus 1? Well, it's just customary. We're going to we're going to put it back kind of in the format from which it originally came. We're going to practice simplifying so that if we needed to use this, um we, we it's, it's easier to use if you put it back into the original format. Yeah, it would be what? pi plus 1. Very good. When you change the sign of the exponent, if there's more than one term, you have to factor it out or distribute a negative. Another way to look at it is to factor out that negative and say that it's to the negative quantity pi plus first, and then when you bring it to the bottom, you change the sign. So you can just change both signs. All right, so that one was interesting because we had an exponent that was not a nice integer or a rational number. It was a real number, but the power rule works with any real number. That's pretty sweet, and pi is very real. All right, on your mark, it said you try. I'm going to try it with you. Remember, rewriting is the key sometimes. Or you can jump in and use the power rule. Once you get the derivative, go ahead and try and uh, clean it up by getting rid of the negative exponent and the fractional exponent. Because eventually we're going to be using these derivatives. And once we take the derivative, it's always better to put it in a usable format. Perfect. Yeah. And the, 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 the preferred format for using it is no negative exponents. We don't think intuitively as a number to a negative exponent. And a fractional exponent is best to put back as a radical. Because that's something that we can more easily calculate. Not to mention the fact that the multiple choice answer, if you're just finding the derivative, would probably be in that 
format as well. So you kind of have to just be flexible and agile and going back and forth from one version to another version. In order to take the derivative, though, we need it in coefficient times variable x to some power. But then to use it, we kind of like to, again, get rid of negative exponents and fractional exponents. All right, so walking around, I see many of y'all have the, the right answer. Uh, we do have to bring the x to the top, and in one step, the fifth root of x cubed in the bottom becomes negative three-fifths exponent in the top. Multiply. Now, notice I showed this little step right here, which is not a requirement for you, but just kind of keep in mind that this is essentially what we're doing. We're taking the derivative with respect to x of both sides, the verb. And, of course, the derivative of y with respect to x is just dy dx. And this becomes, by the power rule on the right side, negative 18 fifths, x to the negative 3 fifths minus 1 is minus 5 fifths, which is negative 8 fifths. So on this line right here, you're essentially done with the derivative. But now to clean it up, and again, notice I'm still keeping my dy dx. The negative 18 is in the top, the 5 is in the bottom. x slides back down, fifth root of x to the 8. Now I saw some of you all have the negative out front, which is fine. If you bring that negative out front... Just make sure that it is, first of all, on the same horizontal uh, elevation or altitude as the division bar, and make sure that it's not too close. Like if you put the negative right there, can you all see the space in between there? I can, but that's just not good enough, so make sure that you make sure there's, an, there's enough space. But you don't want it too far away, right? <laughs> that's that supposed to be a negative answer? I don't know. And it doesn't work if you just put it on the other side either, right? Okay. So I, I like to just either throw it in the top or throw it in the bottom. If there's only one term in the top and bottom, it doesn't really matter. But it, it becomes a problem if there's like two terms in the denominator. And if you slide it too low, let's say, you're like, does it distribute or is it, or is it just that first term that's negative? So anyway, just be careful with that. All right. Um, questions on the power rule? Fun, 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 fun? No, not fun? Just uh, It's one too many fun. Fun, fun, fun. Fun, fun, fun. Uh-oh, someone's yawning. That means you're oxygenating your brain for the next problem. I like it. If you would all like to yawn, because apparently they're contagious. Hmm. No one? <laughs> you're inoculated against yawn? Wow, okay. I never got my booster shot for the yawn. Okay. If f of x is equal to x to the fourth halves, find each of the following. Find each of the following. I'll let you do it, okay? I'll give you about 30 seconds because now this is a power rule, right? Piece of cake. I will tell you this. Before you can find f prime of negative 1, you need to find f prime of what? x, right? You need to find f prime of x first, and you need to show that. Always use the correct notation. So you do it there on your iPad. I'll do it up here on my iPad. And we will compare iPads. Do I get negative 2? Uh-huh. Yeah, the graph of 1 half x to the 4th. The parent function is x to the 4th, which looks like a parabola, except between negative 1 and 1, it's like closer to the x-axis. So it kind of drags a little bit more. And then outside 1 and negative 1, it's a little bit steeper. The 1 half just compresses it vertically. So it looks pretty much like a, like a parabola that's a little squattier. Um, so at negative 1, we're trying to find the instantaneous rate of change of the slope of the tangent line. I came up with negative 2, which is pretty reasonable based upon my graph. Did y'all come up with negative 2? All right, let's look at the notation then. Uh, we did have to rewrite f of x, so I wrote it as 1 fx to the fourth. So I would expect to see that here earlier on. In the future, you know, you could just probably just say it's 4x cubed, the 4 halves becomes 2. 
But right now, I want you to rewrite it as AX to the N. Then the derivative of the left becomes F prime. That's important to show. And then 4 times a half is 2X cubed. And then when you go from a variable to a number, you need to show that on both sides. So F prime and negative 1. You don't have to show the 2 negative 1 cubed. If you can just do that in your head and call it negative 2, that's fine. But as long as it's labeled to F prime and negative 1, I'll know what you did to get to negative 2 without showing this step here, which wouldn't be needed. Okay, what's F prime of 0? Well, let's look at that from the graph before we do the calculations. If this is what the graph looks like, then F prime of 0 would be the slope of the tangent line at 0. What does the tangent line look like there? It's a horizontal line, and what's the slope of a horizontal line? 0. So we should get 0 there. Well, we already have our derivative, so we don't need to kind of reinvent the wheel. We'll just go F prime of 0, and we'll plug it back into 2x cubed, which is our derivative. So 2 times 0 cubed without a calculator is 0. Okay, um, now what's cool about the derivative is you can use it as a formula. Let me just kind of talk about this right now. The derivative was 2x cubed. You could think of it as having two unknowns, just like a, a regular function. You have a, an, an output and an input. But you could, you could solve for either one of those if you know the other one, right? So what we're doing now is we're plugging in an x value and determining the slope there. But let's say you wanted to know on a particular graph where the slope was 0, or what x value is the slope 0. You can actually set the derivative function equal to the slope that you want, and then solve for x, right? So if I set it equal to 0 and I solve for x, 0 halves is 0. Take the cube root of 0, you get 0. Oops, we should do this. And now you have the x value where the slope is that particular number. And this is one of the very powerful um, applications of calculus, finding where the tangent lines are zero, because is that a pretty important point on the graph? Yeah, that's its vertex, or in general, that's a relative minimum value or a local min value. And if we have a function that looks like this, we might be interested in the values of x where those local max and mins occur. And what do we know about the derivative value at each of those? It's zero because they're horizontal tangent lines. So calculus allows us to find these optimal values, local max or local mins, which if you're trying to talk about how to maximize profit, how many units do you need to produce to maximize profit, eh, you might be interested in that x value right there, huh? So you can produce at a rate that maximizes your profit. Calculus will help you find it. All right, uh, let's follow up with C. The, let's find the x coordinate where f has a slope of 128. Okay, so if f prime of x is 2x cubed, do I plug in a 128 for x? No, nope. I set it equal to 128, and I want to know what the x value is. So using it as a formula, then we'll divide through by 2. Half of 128 is 64. Great. Now I need to know the cube root of 64 without a calculator. Or, yeah. Because, in, in, remember, f prime of x is the slope. And now it says, what is the x value when the slope is 128? It's the same thing like if I have f of x equals x squared, and I want to know for what value of x is the y value 4. I wouldn't plug in a 4 for x. I would set the, the function equal to x squared and solve and get x equals plus or minus 2. It's the same thing. We have a function now that gives us the slope. And if you know what the slope is, plug it in for this unknown and solve for x. And you'll know exactly on the graph now where the slope is that. So just think of it as a formula with two unknowns. And if you know either one of the two, you can solve and find the second. Okay? Pretty nice. Now let's see what that is. At 4, we're right about here, right about there. So is that reasonable for a slope of 128? Very reasonable. Yeah. It looks pretty good. Now, notice my x axis is not even drawn to scale. So, in actuality, we would be a little bit farther out than that. And notice that this function is increasing at an increasing rate. So, as you go to the right, it gets pretty steep pretty quickly, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, example four. We have a few minutes left. I think we can hammer out example four. If f of x is 3x squared, we want to find the equation of the tangent line at x equals negative 2. Hey, we did this on the quiz yesterday, right? Remember how you found the slope? You used the 
alternate form. Do we have to do that anymore if it doesn't say? No. All we need for the equation of a tangent line is the slope and the point. Well, let's find the point first. The point's going to be negative 2 comma f of negative 2. And how do we find f of negative 2 if f of x is 3x squared? Plug it into f, right? That's your y value machine. Don't lose sight of the fact that that's your y value, quote, unquote, machine. So negative 2 squared is 4. 4 times 3 is 12. So we're at the point negative 2, 12. Now the slope. How are we going to figure out what the slope at the point is? Slope at a point. Slope at a point. That's the, um, that's the derivative at that x value. So I need f prime of 2 to get the slope. Well, before I can find f prime of 2, I better find f prime of x. So the derivative of 3x squared by the power rule is 6x. Piece of cake. Done. Nice. And now f prime of, what was the x value again? I forgot. Negative 2? If I plug it in, I get 6 times negative 2, which is negative 12. We just found the instantaneous rate of change. All we had to do was multiply and subtract. Galileo could never do that. Do you think Galileo knew to multiply and subtract or how to do that? He certainly knew how to multiply and he knew how to subtract, but he didn't know that doing that on a polynomial would give you the derivative. He didn't know that. Wow, poor guy. Um, so we get negative 12. Now that we know the slope is negative 12, here's the equation of the tangent line in Taylor form. Y equals the Y value 12 plus the slope, which is minus 12, times X minus negative 2, which is X plus 2. Right, y value plus the slope times x minus the x value. That should be coming routine. And the normal line, oh, we got this, right? It's going to be 12 something and x plus 2, right? The only thing that's going to change is the slope. It's the only thing. If the tangent line is negative 12, what's the slope of the normal line? Positive 1 12th. Good, the opposite reciprocal. Now, this one, I don't know if we're going to get a chance to finish it. So maybe I'll just start it tomorrow. We'll pick up here. This is going to be a free response question on your next test, something very similar to this. So make sure you know how to do this. If you want to try it without me, we're going to find the points where the normal line intersects the graph of 3x squared. We have the equation of our normal line. We have the equation of our function. To find out where two graphs intersect, what do we do with their, inter their equations? You set them equal. So that's what we'll do tomorrow. We'll pick up there. Make sure that you're trying out the worksheet problems based upon the power rule now. Uh, I think you'll find it to be very, very, very fun because you're not having to use the limit definition anymore.